Hello. Uh, today I'm going to read from the correspondence of Sir Anis Sato, British Envoy in China, 1900 to 1906, Volume 1, which I have edited uh, and which I have recently published as a six volume series. Um, so, first of all, the contents I will explain. Uh, there's a preface by myself, uh, images. There's an introduction by Dr. Andrew Hillier. Um, there's a chronology and uh, bibliography, uh, an introduction of my publications, internet links, and so on. Um, uh, the main content is, of course, the papers themselves, which are class PRO 30 slash 33. Uh, and 71, 303371, PRO 303371 is the Foreign Office, letters from the Foreign Office to Sato 1900 to 1901. All the letters are, or almost all of them are to Sato. Few replies are written on the letters. Uh, the next one is PRO 303372. That's the Foreign Office letters 1902 to 1903. Uh, the next one is uh, 73, which is the letters from the Foreign Office 19 in 1904. 74 is in the Foreign Office in 1905. 75 is from the Foreign Office in 1906. And then PRO 303376 is uh, a small file of uh, letters from the War Office and the Office of Works, which was uh, responsible for the buildings in China and Japan, based in Shanghai. Um, uh, PRO 303377 and following through to uh, 710 are legation staff uh, papers, uh, letters. Uh, 77 is from Reginald Tower, 78 from uh, F.E. Wilkinson, 79 is various, 710 is various, and then actually 711 is uh, papers. And then uh, 712 is uh, letters from Sir James Mackay, uh, who was tasked with uh, negotiating a commercial treaty. So um, without further ado, I want to read the preface, uh, which I wrote. Okay, here we go. The following seeks to represent as closely as possible what a researcher would see in the mostly handwritten files of the Sato papers on a visit undertaken if time and other circumstances, for example, pandemics permitted, to the National Archives of the UK in Kew, West London. These precious documents were left to the nation in the last will and testament of the distinguished scholar diplomat, Sir Ernest Mason Sato, GCMG PC, 1843-1929. And he clearly hoped that many historians would consult them understand their importance and make use of his legacy. This substantial book is part of a long-term project dating back to 1994, when my Sato adventures began with the purpose of making the papers of this extraordinary man more easily accessible to scholars and the inquisitive general reader. This volume is just a small part of the available papers on China, the more so uh, since it was and is a much larger country than Japan and so Sato had to manage many more consular staff. Sato also had many dealings with others, including inter alia, the corps diplomatique, that's the diplomatic body or his colleagues, the British army and Navy, the Indian colonial government, the large diverse and sometimes troublesome British community of missionaries, bankers, businessmen, journalists, globe trotters, etc., information gatherers, in other words, spies, the Chinese Imperial Family and the for Chinese Foreign Office, the Wai Wupu, formerly the Tsungli Yamen, viceroys in the Yangtze and elsewhere, the Imperial Maritime Customs Service led by Sir Robert Hart, and of course, the British Foreign Office. In the wake of the tumultuous Boxer Uprising of 1900, Sato relieved Sir Claude Maxwell MacDonald, 1852 to 1915 at Peking. The latter was thought by the Foreign Office to require leave after the strain of the siege of the legations in whose defense he had played a leading role as a former soldier. 
But in the event, somewhat surprisingly, they swapped posts with Macdonald taking over at Tokyo. Sato was initially on August 20th, 1900, appointed Her Majesty's High Commissioner and Plenipotentiary responsible for negotiations leading to the settlement later known as the Boxer Protocol, signed by many countries with the Qing government on September 7th, 1901. Then on October 26th, 1900, he was notified by Lord Salisbury that Queen Victoria had appointed him Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary, usually referred to simply as Minister, which was the same rank as he had held at Tokyo uh, from 1895 to 1900, though better paid. However, Sato was technically High Commissioner from September 1900 until January 22nd, 1902, when he presented his credentials to the Chinese Emperor and he officially became Minister in February. I have already published four large volumes in Kindle and paperback formats, and also actually a hardcover, of Sato's papers from his time as Minister in Japan, 1895 to 1900. That's available on Amazon. And this China series now in preparation, uh, in actual fact, it's complete now, is likely to amount to at least six volumes. In fact, it has amounted to six volumes. China was the zenith of Sato's professional career as a diplomat, after which he retired in 1906. He never served in Europe, nor did he become an ambassador, which was indeed unlucky for his personal career, given his great ability and most useful contributions. Yet I feel sure that Europe's loss was East Asia's gain, all the more so when examining his meticulously arranged papers 120 years later. He was, all things considered, the right man in the right place, both then and now, from our point of view as historians, that is. Um, like the equivalent first volume of the Japan series, this volume comprises mainly letters to Sato from the Foreign Office, but also from Peking Legation staff and a few others. And lastly, from Sir James Mackay, charged with negotiating a commercial treaty with the Chinese government. The transcriptions which form the core of this work were produced mainly from microfilms supplied by Adam Matthew Publications, China Through Western Eyes, part six, or digital copies of these, which I've made in Japan. When time allowed, and in case of doubt, I checked the originals at Q, but residing in Japan, it would have been impossible to work solely from the original documents. Indeed, this would probably have been very difficult, even if I had resided in the UK, given the huge volume of material. I am very grateful to Dr. Andrew Hillier, who is an honorary research associate of the University of Bristol for writing the introduction to this book. He is known for his family connections with China, which are longstanding and important. And he has written about them in Mediating Empire, an English family in China, 1817 to 1927, Folkestone Renaissance books, published in April, 2020. He has great knowledge of China in the relevant period. No less an expert is Dr. J.E. or Jim Hoare, formerly of HM Diplomatic Service and SOAS, uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies, who has again provided invaluable assistance with this volume. This is also an appropriate place to thank once again all those scholars and others who have most kindly supported and encouraged my efforts so far including my wife, uh, Asako, who has put up with a great deal, and in particular, all of the following gentlemen who have generously provided advice and written forwards and or introductions for my other works. Dr. J. E. Hoare has done eight. He's done more than anybody. Professor Thomas Otte has done two. Professor Robert Morton, two. Sir David Warren, two. Professor Nigel Braley, uh, the late Professor Nigel Braley, one. The late Hugh, Sir Hugh Cortazzi has done one, Professor Ian Nish has done one, Professor Peter Kornitsky has done one, and last but not least, Mr. William Kaur, who wrote the preface for my first book, published by Edwin Mellon Press of Lampeter in 1998. That's the orange book which I've shown on previous videos. I would, in addition, like to thank the other publishers, in particular, Mr. Takahiko Kaneko of Edition Synapse of Tokyo and Eureka Press of Kyoto, who kindly produced several magnificent hardcover limited editions of Sato's diaries edited by me starting in 2003. 
I would also like to thank the self-publishing company, Lulu Press and Amazon. And it would be remiss of me to fail to express my sincere gratitude to my employer, Kyushu Institute of Technology, which we often call QTech, for providing me with a stable platform and the wherewithal over many years with which to conduct my research. A word should be said about the choice of cover for this edition. Look at, there we are, there's the cover. This is the hard cover, but it, the cover is the same for the paperback. Um, while it is a standard cover available from the publisher, Amazon, in my mind, it expresses two quite important things. First, the dust of Peking, on which Sato himself remarks in A Diplomat in Japan, chapter one, where he mentions the dirt and dust of the streets in wet or fine weather. And second, the tumult of the Boxer Rebellion or Uprising and its aftermath. You can see that the design is rather uh, tumultuous. Um, and indeed, we in Japan are still to this day plagued by occasional winds from the Gobi Desert, bringing what in Japanese is called Kosa, literally yellow sand, or in English, Loess, L-O-E-S-S, -S, a rather unusual word. Lastly, while great care has been taken in the production of this volume, all and any surviving errors in transcription, typographical errors, etc., and also the few sections deemed illegible or in the worst case missing are my responsibility and apologized for in advance. Ian Ruxton, Kyushu Institute of Technology, uh, QTech, May the 8th, 2021. Okay, here's the next part, which uh, is Sato in 1903. And if we just turn the next page, there's a couple of other photographs. Uh, this is the British minister and his staff in 1901, that one there on this one, sorry, not that one, this one. And this, this other one is Sato with Chang Chi Tung in 1902, the Viceroy. Um, uh, he meet, meets him off Nanking on board HMS Eclipse. Uh, then we've got student interpreters at Peking. And Sato started his career as a student interpreter in Peking. So that's the kind of thing. And then on the other side, we've got uh, Thomas, Sir Thomas Sanderson, uh, as done by Spy, or Vanity Fair. And his nickname was Lamps because of the strong thick lenses in his spectacles. So now I'm going to read the introduction by Dr. Andrew Hillier. Introduction. As the Boxer Uprising gathered momentum, Lord Salisbury, Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary, decided that Sir Ernest Sato should take over from Sir Claude MacDonald as British Minister to China. And when the siege of the legations began, the need became all the more urgent. As the first letter in this volume indicates, this was because Salisbury, who had come to know Sato well during his time as Minister in Japan, believed that he had the requisite coolness and experience for dealing with the problems that lay ahead. Written by Sir Thomas Sanderson, the Permanent Undersecretary, PUS, shortly after his meeting with the Prime Minister at Hatfield, the letter typifies the informality of this correspondence and reflects the easy relationship which Sato enjoyed with both politicians and officials in London. Cutting short his leave, he attended a meeting at the Foreign Office the following day. Two days later, the Allies reached Peking and lifted the siege, and shortly afterwards, the Empress Dowager and the principal Qing officials fled the city. Sato arrived in Shanghai on the 29th of September, 1900. Initially appointed as Her Majesty's High Commissioner and Plenipotentiary to negotiate with the Chinese government, and only formally becoming British minister in February, 1902, Sato's initial task was to resolve the many complex issues that arose once the siege had ended. How was the city to be administered and law and order to be restored? What sort of relations would be forged with the court and Qing officials? And what punishment and reparations would be demanded? And how would the competing claims of the Western powers, and in particular, the rivalry between Japan and Russia be managed? Implicit in these issues was the more far-reaching question, 
To what extent would the foreign powers continue to occupy and exercise control over the country's sovereign territory? Over the next five years, adding, acting in accordance with an increasingly independent foreign office mind, SATA would play a key role in resolving these issues and ensuring that Britain retained its dominant position. Uh, see uh, T.G. Otte, The Foreign Office Mind, The Making of British Foreign Policy, 1865 to 1914, published by Cambridge University Press, 2011, pages 259 to 268. That is a footnote uh, by Andrew Hillier. Whilst the other powers would exercise authority in their respective spheres of influence, and Russia would continue to be a threat in Manchuria until its defeat in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-5, China's territorial integrity would be substantially preserved. If the official accounts of the account of these events can be found in the Foreign Office files in the National Archives, they only provide part of the picture. Unlike his predecessors, and most famously the hopelessly idle Sir John or Jack Walsham, Sato was a most methodical paper worker, and as well as keeping a detailed diary, he maintained files of personal and semi-personal correspondence and a mass of other unofficial papers, which he then left to the state. The official correspondence is primarily to be found at TNA, the National Archives Foreign Office 17 and Foreign F0228. And uh, there's also mentioned in the footnote of the diaries, Peking diaries, which I have already transcribed. Uh, we're using Peking rather than Beijing uh, because that's what was used at the time. Um, his arrival in Peking coincided with Salisbury relinquishing the Foreign Office and Lord Lansdowne taking over as Foreign Secretary. This heralded a new era in which the PUS, Permanent Undersecretary, and his staff, deceptively called clerks, although they represented a significant and extremely knowledgeable body of administrators, would exercise a greater influence in the decision-making process. Although Sato's immediate point of contact was the Assistant Undersecretary, Francis Bertie, uh, or sorry, Barty, I think is the correct pronunciation, even though it's it's uh, spelled B-E-R-T-I-E, -E. Barty, Francis Barty. It was Sanderson, affectionately known as Lamps, with whom he had and would continue to have the closest relationship. Somewhat stiff in manner, Sanderson had a sharp sense of humor and was not without artistic accomplishments. And this may have chimed with Sato, who had a number of outside interests, including a passion for botany. Barty, who had little time for the PUS, was, by contrast, noted for his violent temper, temper, his petulance, and his caustic tongue, although Sato does not seem to have been on the receiving end. Um, the tension in the relationship is perhaps evident in an early letter from Sanderson to Sato, in which he says somewhat mischievously, you must take my letters as merely affording sidelights and gossip and anything you want considered had better be written either to Lord Lansdowne or Barty. It is not quite pleasant for the latter that I should put in private letters about business of which he has the direct management. In fact, there would be plenty of business in these letters from Sanderson. Fragmented though the material is, it is its informal nature which contributes to our understanding of Sato's time in Peking and of his, of his relationship with the Foreign Office and consular officials, both in the legation and in the field, adding detail and personal nuance to that story. After a fiery youth in P.D. Coates' memorial word, memorable words, I'm sorry, Sato had turned into an efficient, wary, discreet, and impeccably groomed diplomatist. This is from P.D. Coates, the China consuls, British Consular Officers, 1843 to 1943, Oxford University Press, 1988. Um, and then there's a reference by uh, Andrew Hillier to uh, uh, Robert Bickers, the, sc the Scramble for China, Foreign Devils in the Qing Empire, 1832 to 1914, London, Allen Lane, 2011, uh, concerning um, Sato's fiery youth with the student interpreters in Peking in the early 1860s. 
So he was an impeccably groomed diplomatist. This last point was reflected in his outfit allowance of 1,000 pounds, a handsome sum, even if it included the cost of furnishing his accommodation. And whilst this correspondence is always discreet, much of it, both with the foreign office and with the legation secretaries is conversational in tone, importing a latitude which would not be allowed in official letters with wide ranging discussions, affording time to consider issues and avoid hasty decision making. Although instructed to do nothing which would diminish Macdonald's authority, Sato took charge immediately. And since by accident, not design, he received almost no official communications during his first few months in China. He was left to settle some difficult questions on his own initiative. Once the victory parade had marched through the forbidden city and a swathe of suspected boxers had been summarily executed, the key issues concerned the protection of the Northern Railway from Russian encroachment, both within and outside the wall, agreeing the 12 point protocol, which included agreeing which ringleaders were to be executed and the amount of the indemnity and negotiating the return of the Empress Dowager and the court to the capital. Much of this is reflected in the first two sections, but for the last issue, we see in section nine how Sir Walter Hillier, as acting first secretary, offered his services as a mediator. In the event, the court returned without the need for such intervention, and by the end of 1902, the Empress Dowager was back in the Forbidden City, entertaining the diplomatic wives to tea, and the new legation quarter was taking shape. The other issues were also resolved, albeit Hart, that's Sir Robert Hart, with whom Sato tacitly agreed, considered the size of the indemnity of 67 million pounds as nothing but bad. With Britain's interests in the Northern Railway safeguarded, Attention turned to China's infrastructure more generally, and in particular, the financing of railway construction, an area where the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank through Guy Hillier, the manager of the Peking branch, and its associated engineering company, the British and Chinese Corporation, would be amongst the principal players. What is striking is how much in the post-boxer world, the administration, the foreign office and the British minister were keen to be involved in these discussions not just for geopolitical reasons, but also to promote Britain's commercial interests. Whereas Salisbury and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Michael Hicks Beach, Black Michael, considered that the government should abstain from taking any interest in the affairs of merchants and financiers, with competition for railway loan business intensifying and other banks actively supported by their governments, there needed to be a significant change in approach. This also emanated from the changing nature of decision-making in the Foreign Office. Having taken over from Salisbury, Lansdowne was far more inclined to consult with his officials and leaned heavily on Sanderson, who in turn would discuss these issues with Sato and he in turn with the bank in Peking. The Chinese for their part were becoming more astute in retaining control over the underlying assets and at playing the powers off against each other in negotiating the terms of the loans. They were also keen to recover assets, which they believed had been unlawfully seized during the Boxer Uprising, the Kaiping Mines being the prime example. Initially, the property of a Chinese consortium at the time of the Boxer Uprising, the mines had been acquired by a British-based syndicate in a dubious transaction, which Yuan Shi Kai, who following the death of Li Hongzhang became the, Qing, the Qing's most powerful minister, was determined to challenge. As appears from letters threading through these and other files, the dispute which reached London's High Court in 1905 and later the Court of Appeal caused the British government much embarrassment with the trial judge rejecting as untrue much of the evidence given on behalf of the defendants by, amongst others, Herbert Hoover, C. Algernon Mooring, a prospective member of parliament, and Gustav Detring, leaving Sanderson much amused by their suggestion that the judge had been biased in favor of the Chinese plaintiffs. However, although they succeeded in much of their claim, the plaintiffs failed to recover ownership and the dispute would drag on well beyond Sato's time, causing his successor, Sir John Jordan, further headaches. 
The correspondence also reveals the somewhat uneasy relationship between the Inspector General of Chinese Maritime Customs, Sir Robert Hart, and British officials. Described as more Chinese than the Chinese, Hart almost reveled in the difficulties that the succession was causing, insisting that Robert Breeden, his brother-in-law, should be appointed despite his being intensely disliked by the Foreign Office and the Customs Commissioners, as well as by Hart himself. As Sato, as Sato Riley observed, I do not think any suggestion to Hart that his recommendation of B, that's Breeden, would undo his life's work in China is likely to have any effect. He does not believe that any man can carry on his work, and the notion that it would fail on his retirement is not without its pleasing side in his eyes. Beyond these high-level issues, there is also a pleasantly serendipitous and inconsequential flavor to the correspondence. On the 12th of April, 1901, Sanderson sent Sato no less than three letters, the first providing a glimpse of how business was to be transacted in the new Edwardian era. Barty has gone off to Italy for a month and I am temporarily in charge of you. Lord Lansdowne is gone to Scotland for two days of semi-Elysium by the side of a salmon river with a gilly behind him carrying a gaff in one hand and a box full of telegrams in the other. What an image. And then sandwiched between letters dealing with matters of state, there is one from Sanderson questioning Sato's submitting a charge for 10 shillings and sixpence for repair of a present from the emperor of Russia, which was smashed in transit of the bag. This would certainly be rejected by audit office, so we have cut it out. Will you kindly include it in your next account of SS, that's secret service expenses. Set against the 1,000 pounds for outfit, this seems somewhat minor, but clearly not so trivial that it could be ignored by the PUS or omitted by Sato from his files. Whilst the letters need to be read alongside the rest of the correspondence in order to obtain a proper understanding of the decision-making process, they demonstrate how the empathy between Sato and the Foreign Office significantly facilitated that process and in turn enhanced the ambit of the minister's discretion on the spot. That's quoting from Otte, the Foreign, Foreign Office Mind, page four. That relationship was mirrored in Sato's dealings with diplomatic and consular officials at the legation, as can be seen from the correspondence in section seven of the volume, which begins with letters from the first secretary, Sir Reginald Tower, during his three month fact finding tour of the outlying consulates. Strictly off the record, the content reflected what he saw as his duty to speak my mind unreservedly to Sato, and as such, provide an interesting insight into the differences between the various treaty ports, some thriving and some struggling, with almost no trade and no Western merchants, and in the quality of the consuls. Reaching Chifu, uh, Tower was most put out by the nonchalance of Consul Tratman. He did not even offer to accompany, accompany us in a stroll round the town. It is reticence or self-possession amounting to a disease and must be only attributable to sluggish liver. He ought certainly to be sent away from Chifu, which is a really a charming place. On the other hand, when Tower arrived in Swato and was suffering from a bout of fever, he could not have found a better place in which to be laid up. The house is excellent and both James Scott and his wife are most thoughtful and considerate, he wrote. I like both very much. He gives the idea of being a shrewd, sensible man with a strong Scotch accent. Contrasting with Coates's view that with his broad Aberdeen accent, Scott was not a gentleman and had the roughest of manners, on Tower's recommendation, Scott was appointed to the prestigious consulate at Guangzhou. However, as Coates sardonically comments, he may well have, had, have lived to regret that ambition had tempted him. Uh, Guangzhou, I think that's Canton, isn't it? Within three years, he had uh, applied for early retirement on grounds of ill health following a recurring attack of neurasthenia. In addition to showing how important such brief encounters could be for a successful consular career, what comes across from Tower's letters is the pervasiveness of Britain's presence in maritime and riverine China and the willingness and ability to establish new consulates as and where necessary with little reference to the Chinese authorities. Beneath the surface, however, 
there are also indications of continuing anti-Western sentiment with, for example, the respected missionary Timothy Richard expressing himself in the most gloomy terms on the present outlook in China. Tower was followed as secretary by C.W. Campbell, Charles William Campbell, and for him, as with so many officials, the lure, the, the lure of exploring China beyond the wall was irresistible. Making a three month, 1,500 mile journey, principally by mule cart from Peking to Urga, he was, he told Sato, most probably the first Englishman to travel in Eastern Mongolia. His successor, the Honorable Walter Townley, was less attracted by such hardy escapades and a charge d'affaires during Sato's absence on leave in England, he kept the minister fully informed, not only of legation business, but also of its social life, which was not surprisingly, extremely active given the pleasure his extrovert wife, Lady Susan Townley, took in entertaining. How much Sato enjoyed that side of legation life must be more doubtful, particularly as he was finding that the relentless workload and Peking's harsh climate were taking their toll on his health. And by early 1906, he had decided it was time to retire. Despite the personal nature of much of this correspondence, it provides little sense of his private life. A bachelor, he had left his long-standing but unacknowledged Japanese mistress and their two children in Japan. And he seems to have shunned intimacy during his time in Peking. We normally refer to her as common law wife, but anyway, um, his was a masculine world in which women played little part. And even within, within that world, it is tempting to see him as courteous but taciturn and somewhat impersonal in his relations with colleagues. But this may be misleading. There is a warmth in many of the letters and just occasionally some something stronger comes through. The letter from Lancelot Carnegie, the last secretary to serve under Sato and written shortly after he had left China for the final time is particularly striking. I miss you very much. No one to walk with, have tea with and talk to. I cannot well express all I feel on paper but I should like you to know how grateful I am to you for all your kindness and assistance to me in many matters. You have taught me a great deal, among others, perhaps to take my profession seriously. If ever I do anything in the career, you will be able to think that it is owing in a great measure to you and that it is in spite of your example and teaching if I fail. Sato could not have wished for a warmer tribute from his right-hand man. Maintaining close contact from his home in Devon over the following months, he retired in October 1906. These letters, therefore, provide a kaleidoscope of legation life, of the minister's relationship with the Foreign Office and with senior officials in Peking, and of the development of Sino-British relations in the aftermath of the Boxer Uprising. By the time of Sato's retirement, a measure of stability had been restored, and as China entered a new phase, there was, as Sir John Jordan would find on arrival, an enthusiasm for reform, which was infectious and touched virtually every aspect of life. Few would predict that this would be the final phase of the Qing, and that within five years, it would be overthrown and replaced by a republic, events which Sato would observe from the peace of his Devonshire home. Andrew Hillier, April 2021. And I am most grateful to Andrew for this very splendid introduction. Um, and I think that is the point at which I will uh, stop. Um, I could, of course, read the one or two of the letters, but I think that's going to make this video too long. So thank you very much for listening and watching, and uh, we'll see you anon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.